This is our second to last panel, uh, and this one is um, we call we call it women in hip hop business and culture. There was um, some concern that we didn't want to be sort of cliche like women in hip hop and sort of have um, that that same old conversation. We wanted to have a, a more um, the next conversation moving a little bit forward. So the inspiration of putting together this crew here was to give you different women who are excelling actually in different aspects of the business, the music, and the culture. Uh, primarily as uh, to tell their stories, to inspire the next generation of not just women, but of all of us. Um, because men, male or female, black or white, whatever it is, uh, these are successful people. So we want to tell their stories, um, but take a moment, in, a moment in time to make sure that we are uh, remembering to tell this, the, the story of women in the culture but sometimes you only hear one aspect of it. But here we're gonna get uh, four different ones from different uh, professional disciplines, different trials and tribulations, and different levels and uh, manifestations of success. Um, so we're looking forward to this one, and I wanna introduce our uh, moderator for, for this panel, is uh, for all of the uh, accolades that we receive for putting on this event together, it, it would not be possible for our moderator, Ebony Jackson, who is not only uh, my partner in the Brooklyn Bodega and the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival, the vice president of production and finance, but is also my wife uh, and has been in the trenches with each other, had our backs for many, many years. So whatever love that certainly I get needs to be shared, equally shared with her. And um, I, I, we, we couldn't think of a better person that could help lead this discussion. So with that, I pass it off to Liz. This is Ms. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Can we, is this on? Okay. So thank you, Mr. Jackson, uh, for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Ebony Jackson. I'm the director of production and finance for Brooklyn Bodega, the company that produces the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival. Um, I, I want to welcome you guys. Many of you guys have been here for several hours. I see some familiar faces here. Um, so I want to thank you guys for, for being here and for hanging out. Uh, right off the bat, I want to thank my very esteemed panel of uh, women that I have here. I'm very, very excited to have uh, these ladies here with me today. Uh, I'm going to give each of them a chance to give a brief introduction of themselves. We'll have some uh, discussion points that I've prepared, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you guys. Um, realizing that we're running a tad bit late, I'll keep it moving. Um, but this is gonna be a really great panel and there's tons of, of um, lessons to be, to be learned here today. Um, so again, today we are joined by, to my immediate right, we have Tia Williams, who is um, a, a college friend of mine, um, but even back then, she was um, a force to be reckoned with in the um, beauty, um, black, black beauty culture. So we're very, very lucky to have her here today. And I'll give you a chance to, to introduce yourself a little bit more later. To Tia's immediate right, we have um, Jen BK. You probably will recognize her voice. <laughs> when, when she starts to talk, that's what I recognize about her, um, who is, um, if you don't know, she is one of our uh, esteemed radio personalities from probably one of the biggest uh, radio stations here in town. The big, all right, all right. <laughs> Hot 97. So we're very happy to have her here. All the way down on the end here. Um, is the woman with no name tag because I messed it up, but not because she is not important. We have um, Kim Osario, who is um, a legend in the culture. Uh, we had a panel earlier about hip hop journalism. She, she absolutely could have been on that panel um, and probably every panel that we've had today, but has done many, many, uh, so many jobs within the industry. And I think we're gonna have her touch on all of those. Um, as well. So right now I'm going to start uh, with you, Tia. Why don't you just take a couple of minutes and, and tell the people what you think they should know about you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm Tia Williams, um, and I'm in college with Ebony, and I was a beauty editor at magazines for a really long time. Um, Elle, Glamour, Lucky. Does anyone remember who I am? Okay. Yes, I am. Um, and Essence.com um, for a 
very long time, I was the only black beauty editor in the industry that was working at Essence or Ebony. Um, so I mainstream magazines, which was an interesting struggle. Um, and I'm also an author. I've written five books, including Ex Mom Diva and The Perfect Fine, which just came out in April, and um, Iman's makeup book. Um, and now, has anyone heard of Bumble and Bumble? Yes. So I'm the copy director at Bumble and Bumble, so I name all the products and I write all the packaging and, um, you know, the ads. So I've been in beauty, I've been writing in beauty and um, in the fiction space for 20 years. So, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm Jen, also known as Jen from Brooklyn, a hot 97. Um, I guess, how far back do you want to go? Not the far go back, all but the way back. back. Go all the way back. Uh, well, I first started interning for Bad Boy Records, uh, working primarily with Diddy. And then I then started another internship over at Hot 97, where I've been for the last nine years. So I actually started working with DJ Enough and Funk Flex, doing things with them. And then um, I moved on to become the associate producer. How many of you guys remember Cypher Sounds and Rosenberg Morning Show? Yes, those are my mentors. So I actually started working with them and filling in. Next thing you know, um, I actually got appointed as social media director of Hot 97. So not only am I on air, I'm also the person behind Hot 97 Social, as well as our website, hot97.com. I'm also the content manager for that. And I also host my own show. It's called Ladies First. If you guys haven't seen it, please check it out. It's all about women empowerment. I feature a ton of amazing women from all walks of life, people who are established or are still growing or I think are just super dope that people need to look out for. And um, I'm grateful to be on this amazing panel with these two amazing women as well as you, Ebony. So uh, thank you. Oh, and my radio show is on Sundays. I got mad stuff to say. I feel bad. Um, on Sundays from 10 to 2 p.m. so you can tune in. It's called the BK Brunch and um, listen in. Hello everyone. My name is Kim Osorio. I'm gonna look at the time because if I go all the way back to my roots in hip hop <laughs> and things I've done in the industry, that'll take up the entire time. So, um, but let's get a little bit. I started off um, actually this is gonna sound real cheesy and corny. But I would say that my career in hip hop started at a very young age when they used to let us break dance in the gym, in elementary school. It was called Break Dance Fridays. And every Friday you would come and we would play Eric B and Rakim and do all that, you know, play all that hip hop back in the 80s. Um, so I, kind of, I grew up in the Bronx, around Castle Hill, and so I really became immersed in hip hop culture. When I was coming up in college, and after college I went to law school, I didn't really understand or think that a career in hip hop or in, yeah, in hip hop was something that could be profitable for me. Um, I grew up believing being successful was going to college and going to law school and being a doctor or a lawyer, because my parents never really had a college education. So what they saw as success was that. So I kind of went along that path. But during that time, I always stayed, um, you know, I've, I was always into hip hop. And I did a little DJing, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I did a couple of internships. I interned at BMG Distribution, which was the distributor for labels like Loud, Arista, RCA. Does that still exist? BMG Distribution? No, okay. Um, I interned at Profile back when Run DMC was on the label and that was in the publicity department. So I was doing everything from publicity to marketing. I, I had another internship, I can't remember, but I did a lot of them. Um, but all of that is to say that I hopped around from different departments. But at the core, who I was was a writer and I was always writing. And as I started to learn and meet new people in the industry, I started to understand what that career was, writing about hip hop. And of course, at the time, if you were writing about hip hop, the place that you wanted to work was the source. So I aspired to get to the source. So I did a lot of writing assignments back then for different magazines, but ultimately I wanted to be at the source. 
And when I got hired, I was hired as an associate music editor, and then I went worked my way up to the editor-in-chief role. After that, I worked at BET for six years, and then after that, I went back to the source. Uh, currently, I am working mostly in television production. I just was part of the writing team for a show that aired a couple of nights ago, Hip Hop Honors on VH1, and I also have um, worked in the reality television space uh, writing for that as well. And yes, there are writers, but not in the same way. So um, that's a little summary. Did a, a lot of different things along the way. I also wrote a book called Straight From The Source, which came out in 2008, and that details a lot of, of what I went through in the industry. All right, thank you. So, um, <laughs> just hearing everyone's introduction, I think there's a lot of self-made women here on the panel who've been in the industry for a while um, and have worked their way through different genres, different, you know, departments, different sides of the industry even. Um, I want to talk about and we, before we before we came down for the panel, we started we talked a little bit about our, our kind of love hate relationship with hip hop, right? That many women have, um, you know, but most most of us are you know women of a certain age. We've we've been around in hip hop for a long time. We grew up with it, so it's kind of in our hearts and souls. But it's not as easy to to still be in love with hip hop these days. Can you tell me your thoughts on that? Anyone can take that. It's not as easy to still be in love with your husband either, right? <laughs> Sometimes they can be a pain in the neck. Um, but, and I've been married um, for five years, but I've been with my husband for 13. But hip hop is, I often think about it, it's like a marriage that I'm in. And I can't get out of because it is, it's so, it's so much of who I am. Uh, I think that there has been a very troubled history between hip-hop and women, but as most women are, we're nurturers, we forgive, and we take care of what's our own. And I think that that's part of the relationship that I have with hip-hop. Even though I kind of have grown out of just a lot of what we see today in the hip-hop culture, is always a part of me, so I feel responsible for making sure that I, along with other people, sort of carry it along and try to police what goes on. Um, but I think women are still struggling with hip hop and the portrayal of women in hip hop. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can go on for days about that. But just to, um, I'm gonna get on a soapbox and then gonna be like, this is not that lecture. <laughs> no, you're just speaking the truth though. You know, we were just talking about this before. It's kind of sad that. I asked someone the other day to name me three female hip hop M MCs right now. No one could go past three, and that's sad. So to see, I guess the way hip hop has turned a little, has become a little commercialized for women in general. It seems now that sex is what sells, no longer your lyricism, and um, that that hurts me a little, especially coming from a childhood where I grew up with people like you know um, Lauren Hill, Missy Elliott. Lil' Kim, Foxy Brown. Um, it's just, I wish we got back to that essence where women don't have to show their bodies to, to show that they have talent, they have you know skills, bars. I wish we can go back to a place where that can be showcased instead. So that's my love-hate relationship with hip hop right now. I mean, the, the it seems like the climate of hip hop right now is all about party songs, which is great. You know, Not everything could be conscious rap, I get it. But we also need that, and I think that's lacking a little bit. Yeah, um, hip hop makes me feel really ancient these days. So I have a seven-year-old daughter and um, who is obsessed with Hot 97, and you know, listens, listens, that's the music I listen to, you know? And when I was younger, I remember when we were in college and Doggy Style came out, and that Christmas break I went home and I was like, you know, rapping along to the songs my mother was mortified. She was like, you are not raised this way? Like, what are you talking about? Like, and I just thought she was old and she didn't get it and, and that they were talking about, like you said upstairs, they weren't talking about girls like me. 
And it isn't until you get a little bit older and get a little bit more perspective that you realize how destructive those words really are. Um, so for me, it's like, how do I teach my daughter to, to love hip hop and love the culture and love what it represents and the artistry of it, but also tell her what to ignore the lyrics or, you, you know what I mean? Or, yeah. or you can't, you can't separate the two. So, I mean, it's, it's disappointing to me. I wish that we would move ahead instead of backwards. And, you know, when I was in my teenager, when I was a teenager, when I was in my early 20s, we had Left Eye and Missy and Queen Latifah and Miss the Queen. And see, like, yeah, like, you know, and we just, like you said, we have three now. And can anyone name more than two female hip hop artists? Oh, you can? I actually can't name three. I was just curious. Shout them out. Who do you know? I know who the first person you're going to say is. Uh, of course, there's Nicki Minaj. Of course. Three, Natty, Dej Lowe, Rhapsody. Dej Lowe. Rhapsody's my girl, big up Rhapsody. She is singer and a, and a rapper. Yes. Papa. All right. I'll take it in back. <laughs> but see. We hear we hear a mega average. Y'all didn't know you were gonna get a pop quiz today. Now, but see, out of the five you you just said, two have probably hit the charts. Back then, everyone hit the charts. You know what I'm saying? And there's a difference in that. And that's what, that's what just right. bothers the hell out of me. And, you know, since, you know, we, we, we were talking about it earlier and Kim mentioned it in her intro, you know, just, just last week, actually over the weekend, was the, uh, the, uh... Monday. The, oh, was it Monday? Yeah, All Hell the Queens. Listen, that's how you know I've been working too hard. <laughs> But just Monday, there was um, uh, All Hail the Queens and where that, that featured and Kim herself, um, while not seeing it, did work on it. But I know that. I saw it. I saw a little bit. A I little bit. Message, yeah. and, and I saw the rehearsal. <laughs> I saw it. I want to see it in its entirety. I want to be able to experience it because I think that there were moments there. Not to cut you off, Ebony, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, when you have people like a Queen Latifah who speaks and they say things that really hit home for a lot of women in hip hop because she's like one of the best female success stories in the game. Um, but if you look at her career trajectory, you'll see that it's Latifah very early in her career did things that sort of crossed over uh, from her living single television show to you know the film she started getting into to, uh, you know, every, she, she's a very successful host. She's hosted award shows, her own talk show, and behind the scenes, she's a businesswoman. She's a force to be reckoned with. She is an executive producer of films and TV, and, you know, the list goes on. So I think with a lot of women in hip hop, there is a struggle of being in control of, of their career. And that's part of the reason why some of them maybe don't reach a certain level of success. Now that's not to say that there isn't a double standard and that there aren't all these other things that women have to deal with, but I do feel like as women, it's hard to maintain just that straight, I'm, a, I'm an artist and, and now I'm gonna be successful because at a certain age, you're gonna get played out. I mean, that happens in general in hip hop anyway. Nobody wants to talk about being over 35 because it's just not cool. So women, have a tougher time because you know before you get on that stage, you can't get up there, throw on a t-shirt, and just grab a microphone and rap. I mean, some of them can, but we're expecting women to come out with a full face of makeup, their hair done. A lot of times they're sitting in hair and makeup for three hours. It becomes very costly for women. And it's not the same for men. Men can go pick up their show money um, after they do a show, that's it. They get on stage, they get off. Women, there's a whole other thing involved because it's about presentation and image um, just as much as it is about their expertise and their skill. So I think that that's, you know, just looking at that show and, and, and looking at the women who have surpassed and been very successful, it's important to pay attention to the moves they've made both in front of the mic and behind the camera and just in the background. And you know, I think we talked about how, um, you know, because this this panel is is not just about women who are, like you said, in front of the mic. You know, probably 
many of us have spent years being more behind the scenes and on the business side and even behind the scenes on the radio and entertainment side and behind the scenes you know as a writer um, and even in my own organization there there are tons of women there are they're all sitting here in front of them these are all my, my, my ladies here, right? Tons of young up and coming women who are in the industry, but they're all behind the scenes. They're not out in front. Um, and so why do you guys think that is? Well, I think it's a preference. I think we spoke about this before too, Blake. There's some people who want to be in the limelight, want that spotlight shined on them, and that's cool, but there's also people that are super comfortable being behind the scenes, making the magic happen, and, and really doesn't need that recognition. You know, I mean, for some, for some of us, we battle be in between. For me, I can say that about myself because I worked for many years behind the scenes for Hot 97. And um, I've always dreamt about being a personality, so it really got to a point where I just couldn't take it anymore. And that's when I decided to step out. But again, you know, it's all about your preference, what you're into. Don't feel like you have to be out there on the scene just because everyone else is doing it, you know. For me, it's about people who recognize my work and my accolades and my accomplishments. Whoever needs to know, needs to know. So and you, I don't need to broadcast it to the world. How hard was that for you, that, that stepping out? Oh, I was ready. You got out ready. Because <laughs> at that point, I've been interning for almost five years. And I was just like, my time needs to come now. But you know what? I look back on it. I don't regret it anymore. I used to regret it because I'm a big believer in God and reason and everything, so he made me go through that journey for a purpose. Now not only am I able to be on the air, I can also chop up audio. I'm a certified audio engineer as well. I can produce a show, I can put a record together, I know how to edit video, and also be in front of the camera, so it all works out in the end. I also think it can be tough to find your place as a woman in it because it's such a heterosexual male-dominated you know, industry, and it always has been. And a lot of the women I know that work for record companies and radio stations, they just feel more comfortable sort of like, you know, playing the back a little bit. And um, also safer. Because, um, like Kim um, said earlier, like what hip hop expects from a woman is very different than what they expect from a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to engage in all of that, it's easier to be in the boardroom. Um, so, which is interesting that you mentioned that, Tia, because you you are um, kind of in the forefront of you know black you know beauty blogs and um, and where it's a lot about health and wellness, but also about you know your presentation. Um, and so, how do you balance the substance? Because you know you. You have to be good at what you do, right. male or female, right? Probably if you're female, you, you have to be more than that. You have to be really, really good at what you do. But how do you balance the substance with the presentation? And, and that's important, too. Right. Um, well, I think, so I forgot to say this when I introduced myself. I started the second beauty blog ever. Um, in 2004, it's called Shape Your Beauty, and there just wasn't a blogging landscape yet. I didn't even know what a blog was. Um, I had been a beauty editor in magazines for a while, and then I quit to because I got a two book deal when I was writing my novels. But I so loved speaking to black women, like in a mainstream magazine, you know, in a place where we're, we're, we don't usually exist. And I had been working in, in magazines for so long that a lot of black women knew my byline and they knew to look for me. Like, oh, well, Tia speaks to me, so I want to see what she has to say about this trend or what she has to say about, you know, spring fashion week 2002 or whatever. And once I, I quit, um, I didn't want to, I, I loved having that voice in, in being sort of like, um, shedding some light on the whole beauty space for black women. And you have to remember back then, if you wanted beauty and fashion news, it was magazines or like House of Style on MTV. There were no blogs, there were no blogs, there were no podcasts, it was nothing. Um, and so there, I went into it because I wanted to um, still speak to the black women about black beauty specifically. And it's funny that you asked about substance versus, you know, sort of the aesthetic of it because my approach to writing was super conversational and anecdotal. So it wasn't like, 
Maybelline just came out with a pink lipstick. You have to get it because it's like awesome. I would, it would be like, I just went on a date with this idiot and this is what happened. And I would go through this whole story and then be like, oh, but I had on this fabulous lipstick at the time. <laughs> so it was like, you bought into sort of what was happening with my life and it sort of humanized beauty and, and you got to it through the human experience. Um, so I tried to give the, the I tried to give beauty writing like some happy and some heart by talking about um, what was going on in my life at the time. Um, so Kim, I'm going to ask you to kind of weigh in on that because as a as a as a career vet in the hip hop industry, in lots of different roles, how do you feel your presentation may or may not have played into your level of success? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know if it played into my level of, of success. I'm the type of girl who will still go to the market in her pajamas. And that's something that a lot of people, just industry, would frown upon. Like, oh my God, how can you go outside without your hair done when you're not put, well put together? And as a woman, I always felt like we had to put on you know, this mask and then present ourselves to the industry. But I really haven't been like that. I can get dressed up, I can do the hair and makeup, but who I am and what I do is really what has taken me um, to where I am in my career. It's always been about the work you put in. And I, I wanna go back to something that Jen said because you know, we, we hear about her in her intro and she talks about being in Hot 97, whatever, and then afterwards we hear her say, and I know how to digitize video, and you know I work the audio board, and I think that it's important to understand just when you're getting into the career now, you can't come in with one skill. You have to be able to do all of these things in the background. When I came in the game, it was all about writing, and I learned how to write, and we were very particular with how we wrote stories, and we followed the guidelines, and you know, all of these different things you had to know to be a writer. The way that we told stories was different than the way that stories are told today in hip hop. We did not put ourselves in the stories and now the success in writing is about the bloggers and the personalities who actually put themselves into stories. So I think that you know the industry has changed but something that has always remained was just having this sort of, just a lot of wealth of experience in all of the different fields around you, particularly today, you've got to know how to do everything. If you're going to blog, you have to know how to write, but you also have to know how to upload. You have to know how to size photos. You have to know how to, you know, take your own pictures, uh, crop your own photos, and record video. There's all of these different things that you have to do just to post an article. And it's, a, and it's something that, you know, coming in you have to know because the industry will continue to change. So you just have to kind of roll with it, put your head down and get the work done. But you can still look good doing it, you know. I know there's a lot of women that are like, wait, but I, I like to look good. It's not that you can't do that. It's just that behind that, when you peel off that mask, it's, it comes down to the work that you do because your work will speak for itself. Um, and, you know, just, we're going to take that a little bit further. I think that a lot of um, professional women in hip-hop, or, or probably in any industry, have a bit of a superwoman complex, right? Where they feel like, I, I do have to do it all. I do have to, you know, be an, an, an expert in my field. I have to know how to do every other person's job and my own, and I have to look fabulous while doing it. Um, and that can be... Um, perhaps the reality of, this, of the situation, or is that something that we should struggle against a little bit? How do we, how do we feel about, and I know, personally, I know I have a superwoman complex, because I, I, go, I go to work, I work two jobs, I take the kids to football, then I come back, then I wash the dishes, and then I send some emails, and then, you know, it's two in the morning and I still haven't gotten to bed, so I'm fully guilty of it myself. Um, but is it something that we should celebrate? Is it something that we should push back on? How do we how do we feel about that? I think, it, like you were saying, um, Jen, it's really preference. I mean, for me, yeah, like I'm a single mother. I have a full time job at Bumble and Bumble. I'm a novelist. Um, I still write beauty articles, and I, I've had a migraine since March. And 
for me, like, putting on my eyebrows makes me feel like my life is together. And if that makes me feel like my life is together, that's what I need to do. You know what I mean? Sometimes makeup is armor. Sometimes your hairstyle makes you feel strong. Um, I don't think something, it, something that's so inherently female and feminine, like, uh, you know, I think we should embrace it. If that's your instinct, embrace it. If you're not into that, I don't think you should be expected to put on a red lip. But if it makes you feel like you can face the day, please do it. For me, it's, I think women are all superheroes. That's just yeah. who we are naturally. And I think that's why we kind of have this complex where you know we're just we're doing a million things all the time and we have to get this done because just naturally we're good at it. To be honest, the art, the art of multitasking isn't for everybody. Fortunately, I'm very happy to say there's no disrespect to the men in here, but I think women are better multitaskers. I think we're able to handle the situation without being frustrated or angry, and we're able to kind of rationalize everything. So for me, I don't mind being called a superwoman because it takes a lot for a woman to get her things done. So for me, handling a thousand things during a day is just one of the amazing things of being a woman and getting our stuff done. And also it brings the bout of respect as well in the industry. You know, there's not a lot of people who can, I'm saying, go to the radio, sit behind the desk from nine to six, handle social media, you know, the website, then go go host a show, edit it, go back home, make sure the family's okay, wake up, don't do it again. A lot of women out, a lot of women out there are doing that, and also be a mother and a wife as well. But Jen, do you think that do you think that that's a different reality for some of our male counterparts? Do you think that women are expected to do that while perhaps men aren't? I think so because we've been doing it for so long, right? So now we're all programmed and wired to believe that women are expected to do these things. But you know, like I said, I don't mind it because the poop is in the pudding, right? So the fact that we have this behind us and this, this multitasking thing and, and being superheroes and I keep on our backs, it's, it's not a bad thing at all. I, I feel it doesn't feel like that. I think that um, being successful, you have to define success for yourself. So uh, what I've often told other women who have asked me, how do you do it all? Oh my God, you have three kids, a career, and you got this and that. How do you do it all? And my answer is that I don't. Sometimes I don't do it all. And sometimes I need to sacrifice certain jobs that come up. I can't physically be there for my kids, take care of the house and the family, and take every job that comes. Some jobs come, I don't want to turn it down, but I do, because I know I'm not going to do a good job if I take this job. So I feel like as a woman, you have to figure out what it is that you want to do. What is going to be success for you? Is it going to be reaching that top level at the company, um, that CEO position? Because if it is, then guess what? You might have to sacrifice a little bit with your family. You may get a, you know, you might have to talk to your partner or your husband and, and ask them to pick up a lot of the slack because just being able to do it all, sometimes you just don't have that, the capacity to do it all. But if you're okay with that, I, you know, I think that that's great. And I feel like, I, I told somebody recently, they, they had, um, I was working on a project with them and they had taken a three day leave from the job because um, they wanted to see their son graduate from elementary school. Um, in television production, when you're in production on a show, you don't take any days off. You go 30 days straight, you get the show done. Um, but she made that choice, and was that choice frowned upon? I, I would, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but pretty much everyone was like, she's going to take three days off? Um, and when I talked to her about it, I said, you have to make that decision for you. And you have to be okay with that decision. Because... I know if something came up with my kids and I had to choose, I tell people all the time, I love you, I love this job, but I'm gonna pick my kids. So as long as you're okay with that, I think you can move on. You do the best job that you can to your ability and then you move on and you do another one. So we're gonna move to a slightly different topic now. We're gonna talk about the F word, not that one. 
Feminism. I was gonna say, what's the F word? Yeah, it's not, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I, I have a potty I mouth. I was like, I have my, I have my right. daughter. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a PG panel. Okay? Yeah. My daughter, who's the bad word police, is here, so she, she okay. lets me know okay. whenever anyone says something <laughs> that they're not supposed to say. Look, I'm tired around. Um, so, and I, think, I feel like we've talked around the issue of feminism in our industry, but we haven't exactly addressed it head on. So, um, I'm going to ask each of you, what do you think it means to be a feminist in hip-hop? Either before or now or today or moving forward. How, and do you see yourself as kind of the guardian or the promoter of, of feminism in your particular industries? I stumped you. No, Jen, Jen looked like over at me, yeah, like, go ahead and answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, huh, would I define myself as a feminist? I, yeah, sure. It sounds, sounds great. I love feminism. and I, But traditional feminism, that when you think about the word and what it means, I don't think coming up in the game, I thought of myself as that. Um, but... Uh, I think after having my career and being through the things that I've been through in the industry as a woman, yes, that I would just find myself as a feminist. I don't know um, how many people are familiar with the case that I filed against the magazine. I said I, I worked at the source, um, but I did file a case uh, back in 2005, um, you know, against the owners at the time, not the current owner now, because it's, it's been, you know, taken over. Um, and it was a sexual harassment, gender discrimination, and um, defamation and retaliation lawsuit. And that's the case that sort of led me to tell my story in the book. There was a, um, that was an interesting time for me, you know, just following that case, going through what I went through. But because I didn't come up in hip hop, sort of waving the flag for women. I kind of just did what I did. I worked hard and got to my career, but I never really talked about being a woman in hip hop. So when I filed that case, people were like, or some people felt like, you can't file that case. You can't, you can't do that. That's not what you represent. Um, but I filed it because I felt like I was wronged in my career and I knew what the law was and I had to say something about it. And you know, I wasn't very apologetic, I think, to just initially, before the case, to the struggles of other women in the game. Uh, but ha after going through the lawsuit, it really sort of showed me because I had a lot of women come up to me and talk to me about their own similar experience and the things that they had gone through. So it created this sort of camaraderie among myself with women. So yeah, to answer the question, I guess, yes. Yes, for feminism. Yes. <laughs> um, I think I'm a feminist. I mean, a modern day feminist. Not how you see back in the day where everything was, it was a pro women, and but it was like men suck and like men can't do anything. We're the most powerful beings on the earth. Like, I don't believe that. Men are just as beautiful and powerful as women. It's just, I feel like the way feminism is nowadays, it's about women uplifting each other instead of competing with each other, work together and promote one another because there's only so many few of us doing what we're trying to do. I mean, now it's, it's a lot more than it used to be, but I don't see the, the support that I would hope to see other women do. So as far as myself, I feel like I do that. Hopefully I am an example for the ladies in here. That's why I created my show Ladies First and fought for the show. They didn't want me to do the show because Hot Me 7 is a male demographic. We're between the ages of 18 and 34. So you could imagine walking to my boss's office saying, hey, I want to do a show called Ladies First. He's like, all right, what's it about? Women, okay, <laughs> what you gonna do with that? Are people gonna care? That's his question, that was his question. Are people gonna care about women? And that just slapped me in the face like, are you serious? Is that the mind state of where we're at right now? Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope to be the new generation of radio personalities who can kind of bring women up there to the forefront through and the artists that I have on my show. And hopefully, you know, it, it makes a statement. It makes, it makes some sort of an impact in the culture. Um, but yeah, I, I say I'm a modern day feminist. Um, I'm definitely a feminist. 
I have a little bit of a different experience than the two of you because I've come up in the beauty and fashion industry and that's mostly women. So, I mean, in like 2.5 straight men. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just a completely different sort of demographic. Um, and so the struggle in my industry is not trying to figure out a point of entry for like feminine empowerment, because we're all empowered and we're all women, and we're all out here um, excelling and doing our best. And it was more for me the black woman thing in an all white industry. That, that was what I was sort of, um, I was fighting for us to be heard and for our experience to be considered valid and you know, to get a brown woman on a, you know, the pages of L. Like that, that was more where I was coming from. Like I've never really experienced any sort of like sexual harassment in the office or being treated unfairly because I'm a woman because everyone around me has been a woman. So it's a little bit different. Well, I, and, and when it comes down to it, right? I mean, feminism at its core is about believing that women are equal to men in every way, mm -hmm. right? And so you don't, I tell my, my son, right? They, you don't have to be a woman to be a feminist. You just have to believe in the equality of, of the sexes right. um, and, and promote that in all ways. So I think that that's, um, you know, something that we should all keep in, in mind. I'm trying to raise my daughter and my son to be a feminist, right? So ho hopefully I will be successful. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna, we have a few minutes where we can take some audience questions. Okay, so as women we have the narrative of being petty, um, being catty, being competitive all the time. And even watching the um, hip hop honors, we all saw it, we all loved it, but we all knew that Nikki wasn't there, Foxy wasn't there, their presence wasn't known. But we're constantly trying to put out the image of women empowerment and feminism and womanness. Um, my question is, how do you retrieve mentorship from women? Because Jen, you said your mentors are men. I don't know about you, you know, and I don't you either, but how do you get that guidance and that sponsorship? And not sponsorship just financially, but sponsorship in a way of saying, oh, I saw your resume, oh, I saw the content that you put out, let me go send it to one of my higher ups. Like, how do you get those people? Because I've done internships, I'm in school. I've actually worked at MS as well, the, last year. Oh, okay. And I'm just like, where do you find these women? Not to, I, have no, I have nothing wrong with men being a um, mentor, but I'm, I'm more relatable with, and I'd rather have, I prefer a woman. Have you reached out to women that you look up to mm -hmm. in the industry? And, and, you, and kind of, you know what's weird? Because it's like, people in the industry say, you know, if you ever need anything, just reach out, and you're like, okay. Like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna own that. Yeah. I say that all the time. Yeah, <laughs> takes about four or five emails before I'm like, who right. is this girl? <laughs> and but I will sit down. I just had a meeting with someone, sort of looking for the same thing. I will sit down with you and have that conversation. You know, but you have to be persistent about it. Yes. If you're looking for the mentorship, people are there to help you. I every job that I've gotten, I'm, I'm gonna say, eighty percent of the job that I've gotten have been referrals from people mm -hmm. um, all throughout my career. Yeah, you send your resume in blind, occasionally you'll get a phone call and you sit down for an interview, but at the end of the day, they know who they want to hire. Mm -hmm. So I think it is about establishing those relationships and being very persistent and going after them. Like, you know, I'll give you my email address, email me. If I don't respond, just keep, <laughs> keep hitting me up. Eventually, I'm going to say, who is right. this girl? And what does she want? And okay. I'm going to respond. I'm going to hold you, you to that. Yeah, you should. <laughs> you, I, want you to, I want you to hold me to that. Can, can you also, for me, it's kind of like when I'm at an event, who I talk, when I get approached all the time, right? But the people that really stick out to me are, are the people who are saying, hey, Jen, I'm so-and-so. This is how I can help you versus how can I help you? Because everyone wants to help somebody, right? Everyone wants to help these people that are, are doing amazing things. But how are you going to help me and figure, help my goals and make sure my things, my ship is flowing? I think that's going to make the difference. A lot of the times, a lot these people I feel who you know you want to be mentored by, they get approached all the damn time. Right. If you have a goal, you can tell them what you're good at, your skill set, and your talent, and what you're capable of doing. 
Um, I rest assured you're gonna have a sit down with them. They'll come and wanna talk to you. And have ideas. Yes. Have really, you know, before you approach these people, have ideas. Yes. I have um, young writers reach out to me all the time and they'll ask me things like, how do I get to where you are? And I'm like, ma'am. <laughs> how, much, how much time do you have? Like, what do you mean? You're like, don't try to get to where I am. Like, exactly. you know, pay attention and learn and, and have something to offer me. And, and also, when you have ideas, when you email these people or, or you know, when you reach out to them in events, um, try to figure out what makes you different from everybody else. And be that and do that. And you'll stand out. Yesterday, some, a very high-profile blogger reached out to me and she was like, I need a beauty writer, I have no money, I can pay like $50, you know, like a young, hungry, and off the top of my head, I knew five, the five most obnoxious girls that reach out to me like three times a week and, and make themselves known. Like, be obnoxious, be loud. What are you trying to do? What's your goal? On your personality, okay. All right, did you have a demo put together? Okay, good. I actually just graduated from Kingsborough, I'm going to see college now. Okay. Are you continuing your radio career in your new college as well? That's exactly what I was about to tell you to do. You have to have some sort of a digital presence nowadays to be radio. It's no longer just hopping on the mic. Make sure your social media is up and make sure your YouTube channel is moving. Put all your interviews out, put any of your breaks out, everything. And keep on reaching out to these personalities too. Ask them if you can shadow them. Mm -hmm. That's the point of politeness. <laughs> <laughs> Check. She wants to know if any of us have ever been in a situation where we've had to check somebody that made a sexist comment, right? Hello. But um, in certain situations, you're the only female and you're the only one that thinks from that, that feminist perspective and nobody gets it when you try to check them. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had moments where I had to let it roll off my back. Sometimes I would check them, like sometimes I would explain to them, but like I've tried a lot of different approaches, sometimes it doesn't work. Like I, I just want to know um, what you guys would advise to do in those situations. I say keep checking them. There is, I'm telling you, because in this industry, you gotta demand your respect. If you're just gonna let things roll off of your back and let these guys get away with saying these sexist things, then they're just gonna continue doing it, right? So voice your opinion, and. I believe as a woman, they'll respect you a lot more than that because they expect women to be submissive and just go with, roll with the punches. Once you open that mouth and let them know, no, 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 this isn't going to fly, I think that's when it's going to stop. I never let anyone get away with anything, say anything to me. I always stop them dead in their tracks and they respect me a lot more than that. And I think these days, I think you, you, it's, you know, sexism is like racism. You don't get the hardcore, like, beat you over the head with it. But I know I've been in meetings where, you know, where it's been mostly male, and, and then they start mansplaining things, and they're like, well, you know, in this industry, you have to do it. As if I haven't been in this industry for the, you know, past 20 years. So, no, 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 I know what I'm talking about. I just don't agree with you. So here's what I think, you know, and so I think that you have to, um, you can assert yourself, just as Jen said, um, in a way that's professional, in a way that's, you know, respectful, but also in a way that's forceful, mm -hmm. and, and, saying, no, 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 I, 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 I have an opinion. I know what I want. I know what you just said, and that's not going to, you know, really continue. So I think that, you know, it's, a, it's an art, um, but like anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. We are gonna have to, um, I'm, giving, I'm getting an evil eye here. No. Um, <laughs> not the evil eye. Um, but we're gonna just have to take one more question, and we're gonna unfortunately have to, to wrap up. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but we'll take one more question and then we will. Oh, he's such a gentleman. He's letting someone else see. Yes. That's a man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes.
So what my issue is, is as a woman, it's almost like I have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that I understand and know hip hop before anybody even wants to really listen to what I have to say. Secondly, when, and that's just for men, but then how do I grab the attention of women who may not necessarily be that heavy into it, but want to be into it? So like, my question is how do I, like, even in designing my blog, trying to go forward with it, it's a question of do I present it kind of like asexually, so that someone will be even willing to read what I have to say or take my opinion seriously um, on surface value. I don't know how it is as a woman that some to voice my opinion and someone even want to hear it. Because most times it's like, I have to go into these big, deep arguments and they're like, oh, okay, she knows. Like, she's different. Or, oh, she's not the average woman when it comes to hip hop. You know, the assumption is always, oh, you know, women lean more to R&B, they may know a little bit about hip hop, but they don't know it like a man does. Mm -hmm. So my, for me, my question is how do I make a successful brand being a woman and coming out the gate like, yeah, this is a woman who knows just as much as you, maybe even more, and that I want you to hear what I have to say. I don't think that you should preemptively sort of neutralize when you're talking about designing your blog and making it unisex or asexual. Like, I don't think that you should try to um, forecast what the response is gonna be and, and sort of tailor your content to match that. I think you should work in the opposite direction. Whatever it is that makes you you, whatever your perspective is, do that, you know, push that forward and the people, it'll catch on that way. I think I see a lot of, because there's a thousand hip hop blogs, um, and what's gonna make yours stand out is what you bring to the table. So, I mean, authenticity is so, it's such a cliche at this point, but it's so key when it, when it comes to blogging because that's what people connect to. You know, they, they buy into whatever, you know, is real about you. Because there's so many choices now. I agree with Tia too. I mean, ultimately, it, it boils down to your content, right? Because everyone, blog, blogs nowadays, honestly, it's copy and paste, right? You go to each other's blogs, you copy the same story that's going out, you switch up your words a little bit, and boom, you got a hip hop blog. You know, what content are you going to bring that's original, that's going to make you stand out from the rest? So when you go, at home, go back home tonight, think about what, what's your name again, sir? Oh, I never gave it. It's oh. Nia, I'm sorry. Nia? So Nia, when you get home, think about what is Nia, who is Nia, and how is Nia going to bridge the gap between herself and the hip hop world, mm -hmm. content wise. I'm not talking about as a person. I'm sure you're an amazing person, but digitally, if someone wants to scroll down and read your website, you gotta bring something that they can't find anywhere else. You got it? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you.